For more than a decade, colony collapse disorder has captured headlines. The syndrome causes adult worker bees to abandon the hive, leaving the queen and her immature brood to fend for themselves. She's laying good eggs and she is keeping the hive population up. A good queen, yeah. Due to the crucial relationship between pollinators and flowering plants, the United Nations warned the mysterious phenomenon could be capable of slashing worldwide crop output by one third. It is a concern. Every year there are stories of beekeepers who lose 50, 70, 80 percent of their hives. Um, and it's hit us in the past. Uh, we're doing our best to prevent that from happening. All they can say for sure is that it's a multifaceted problem. Tim Hyatt and his brother Steve are second generation beekeepers in Washington state. With one link in the chain of providing food. The brothers say sporadic losses have plagued apiarists since well before European settlers introduced the honeybee to North America. The U.S. Environmental Protection Agency reports that new cases of colony collapse have declined substantially in recent years. But those closer to the hive point to a dizzying array of more than 60 underlying stressors, including pesticides, disease pathogens, and environmental factors. The varroa mite has been described by many people as probably the number one threat to honeybees. So it has like these um, almost like hook-like mouth seam ripper type appendages. And what they use that to do is to basically rip a hole in the exoskeleton of the honeybee. Dr. Jennifer Hahn is a postdoctoral pathology research associate with Washington State University. She says invasive symbionts like the varroa mite attract several other diseases including deformed wing and Lake Sinai virus. According to Han, these microscopic insects eventually conquer honeybee immune systems that have been compromised by neonicotinoid or nicotine-based insecticides. Imagine having a parasite living on you that's about the size of a dinner plate, that's feeding on you at all times. Decreased flying time and the inability to pollinate are among the negative results from this relationship. Bees, just like any other animals, can get viruses, and we do not have any good treatments, much like we do not have a good treatment for the common cold. Washington State University is employing a multi-pronged approach to boost pollinator populations. Dr. Nick Nager is an entomologist specializing in honeybee analysis whose work grew out of a Department of Defense initiative involving fungi. Post 9-11, Congress passed the Project BioShield Act, which allocated $5 billion towards stockpiling vaccines in the event of a bioterrorist attack. Government research led to work done by mycologist Paul Stamets. His company, Fungi Perfecti, in southern Puget Sound on the opposite side of Washington, are purveyors and promoters of what they call high-quality gourmet and immune-supported mushrooms. Through the course of submitting certain fungal strain samples to DOD, Stamets, USDA, and Washington State University put their heads together and an ancillary partnership with higher education blossomed. Over 10 years ago, Paul Stamets was growing mushrooms and noticed that honeybees would forage in his mushroom beds. Bees normally live in hollowed out logs where they would encounter fungi on a daily basis. Now they live in these very nice, sawn wood hives that have less fungus in them. And so uh, we think that by uh, allowing bees to eat fungal and fungal products again, that this could help restore some of their health. Dr. Nager says his research shows when bees drink liquids extracted from certain mushrooms, it cuts their viral levels a thousandfold. These long-lived polypore mycelium samples are supplied by fungi perfecti. Those fungi tend to produce a whole range of antimicrobial compounds. Dr. Hahn, in turn, utilizes a related component common in most soils. What I've done is looked at a fungus called metarhizium that can infect and kill insects. Eventually, the final project we want to be something probably like a strip that beekeepers can just insert into the hive. So the way this works is that the spores of this fungus land on the skin of the varroa mite and that spore will germinate, burrow its way inside the varroa mite and proliferate inside and kill the bug from the inside out. It's gruesome and fascinating all at the same time. 
The natural pesticide's potential is good news for the region's non-citrus tree fruit producers. Aaron Riggs manages a 69-acre apple orchard on the Columbia Plateau, an area known for its favorable weather and soils. You couldn't set enough fruit if you didn't have the bees. And the bees are the main source of pollination on, on the fruit. You would get some pollination through other insects or things like that, but you wouldn't get near the crop to make it effective uh, farming, to make it you know, profitable if you didn't have the bees. Hundreds of Hyatt honey hives crisscross the U.S. every year on truck beds to pollinate tree fruit and nuts in California and the Pacific Northwest before rounding out the summer with honey production in North Dakota. We have to wait for the sun to go down because the bees will be flying all around the orchard. And then when it's dark like this, the bees will all be home. We'll gather them up and take them to a different location. USDA values national honey production at $320 million per year, but the Evergreen State alone accounted for over eight of the 11 billion pound domestic apple crop in 2018. And while they proclaim apples a $2.5 billion industry there, Washington State University also has earned respect for throwing down the gauntlet in the fight against colony collapse and its root causes. They're doing a lot of work to try to improve bee health, and we're really appreciative of their efforts. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner.